Hello everyone, welcome to my next video. Welcome to all the new viewers and the old viewers and all of the beginners in the world of embedded programming. This video is made for all of you. So upon request this video I'm gonna show you how to start a project from beginning to the end. And let's go. So number one thing, you need an embedded board. And as you know I work on Linux on STM32. So this is the board that I've been recommending ever since as is one of the greatest boards I have. It's the F4 Discovery. It's very versatile and it's very great for new learners. That's because it has loads of on-chip peripherals and the on-board peripherals as well. What am I talking about? Well, this is the board I have also on my desk right now plugged into my computer. It includes of course the ST-Link periphery over here. This is the one that's gonna program the chip and talk to the computer. Here's the main IC, the F407 this, uh, VG. This is the 100 pin, a huge IC with lots of flash, lots of RAM and has lots of pins. And it's nice because it has lots of internal peripheral as well that can talk to also the external peripheral like the onboard button, the MEMS accelerometer, four different color LEDs, the audio DAC, the USB interface and the MEMS microphone. Also, all the pins, as well as supply, are broken out onto the sides of the board. So you can really use this board for learning to talk to different peripherals, over different bus, controls, output pins, anything like that. And I still have a lot of pins untouched by any onboard peripheral that are good for prototyping for different projects before you uh, go ahead and decide on a particular microcontroller that you're gonna use. So I really recommend you to get this board. But no worries if you got yourself another board, a Nucleo or another discovery board, it's gone, all gonna work the same. But if you don't have one, I really recommend this one. It's 20 euros, it's really good price for what you get. So, now to start working on the processor, need some kind of ID. In my previous videos, which you can uh, look, but if you've already seen them, you can know that I talk about the initialization codes, how to start programming, and it's on simple. It's using terminal, debugger, the ST flash tool, the uh, text editor, and that's it. But now I use an IDE because it's very good for debugging and it's kind of mandatory for work as well. And that's why I use the ST provided STN32 cube IDE, which is very similar to the previous system workbench. That's because they're both made on the Eclipse alongside with their own plugins to make them work for themselves. So this one, I already have my dark theme, so you can see it's all nice and dark. And also, no, it's nothing wrong with your monitor. I always have the red shift enabled. This is how it looks like, and it's awful and blue and it's piercing my eyes. So I always have this enabled. So any white backgrounds of web pages don't burn my eyes out. So. Now that you've installed this, it's for Linux, Mac and Windows, let's go! First, we're gonna create a project in your workspace. Workspace is really any folder, you can create it or recreate it itself, where the project settings and everything how your ID looks is stored. So I have untitled folder somewhere on my hard drive. Now let's create a new STM project, clicking this button or you can go to File, New, oops, File, New, STM32 Project. This is going to initialize the target selector. That's why I love the STM32 cube ID because it's also got included the cube MX. If you've used it before, you know that's how it looks like. So this is the MCU selector and this is the board selector. And because we know which board we have and we want the software to do the initialization for all the peripheral that is necessary to make the other peripherals on the board working. That's why we want to tell it which board do we have so it can do the work for us. So we're gonna select the for discovery, here are all the settings, and click next. Let's put a name. Let's set video test. And you can change it, or maybe I have that already. Let's just call it video 70 because that's what it is. And click finish. You don't need next. Next is gonna ask us if you want to initialize all the peripherals in the default mode. So we're gonna click yes. What that does is gonna initialize all the internal peripherals of the microcontroller so it will work with the peripherals that are present on the board like LEDs, ICs for talking over SPI, I2C 
and stuff like that. So the processor will be already initialized so we can just start making our code. But if you would want to do it manually with a fresh microprocessor or just want to know how it's done, I'm gonna do another video on that for a specific application. So you can learn how to do certain things uh, through a series of different videos on different applications because, well, doing some demo LED programs isn't just learning as much. So you can see all the pins that are green are initialized to the internal periphery. So we can see that, let's go to connectivity, i 2 c one SPI1 and USB OTG full speed are initialized. So the pin is defined, it's renamed. So let's see, LEDs are re renamed to LED4. So we know to the pin 12 of the port D, the LED is connected and stuff like that. So that's what the default initialization when we click yes did. There's one thing that I didn't that they didn't do correctly. If we go to the SPI one, we're just gonna do SPI as well communication, so we can talk to the MEMS accelerometer. So we're gonna do a little bit more than just an LED. Uh, the onboard uh, processor or the sensor is not that fast as it's configured. Currently, it's configured as 42 megabits per second. That's for speed of 42 megahertz. The IC, on the other hand, only uh, supports up to 10 megahertz. So let's increase this prescaler so this value goes below the 10 megahertz. 16 should be plenty to have a reliable conversation. Also, if you go into the datasheet, you know that the polarity of the clock should be always high and then it starts clocking low and it clocks and takes data on the rising edge, which is the second edge. The first edge is the first down and the second edge is the up, so two edge. This is not configured by default correctly, so make sure you get this right. If you don't know what I'm talking about, where these settings come, go to the previous video on the SPI peripheral when I talk about the sensor as well and show you around the datasheet where this information comes from. It's in standard peripheral library, but this is exactly the same, just with different uh, formal and that's it. Let's go to the clock configuration to see how it is configured. Well, it's great. The 8 MHz input oscillator with the maxed output speed. That's great. And here with the project manager tab, we can see the first settings that I like to do. Application structure going to advanced. That will include all the source files that are for this processor. They're going to be included in a separate core folder. And that folder, you know that it's only for the core functionality. So you can add your other firmware in the same folder, like in the main project folder. So you know where the core files are and where the additional your libraries and firmware is located. And the second thing I like to take the generate peripheral station as part of .c and .h files. So this means that for every peripheral like i 2 c SPI, USB and so on, it will create an initialization in its own .c and pair each file so it's not all cluttered in the main file and that's what i really like other things you can leave it as they are click save it might ask you if you want to start the configuration and you click yes i also i already did that and clicked the always do that so as you can see it start modifying and here's that core file that folder that i promised and as you can see by the processor use it finished so let's click exit it will bring us back to the see so the code view i never use anything else than this window apart from the configuration window over here so let's go to the core folder and to the source here is the main.c file and let's just bring out also the main.h file in case we need it so why do i have these windows like this well the project explorer is something i don't really use much after i open all the files i need so I usually just go to the edge and just shrink it up as much as I need to. But for the sake of this video, let's leave it like that. Also, I need the console on my right, I just uh, or left, wherever I want, but I need it to have a wide view. Also, the problems, here are all the compiler errors that are gonna go up. I want to see everything. Live expression breakpoints, I use them from time to time, so they're in the same tab as well. Build analyzer, this is what is gonna tell us the size of the code. I don't use that much, so that's why it's there. And here's the outline that I sometimes use and variables that I always use.
so you can configure this as much i really aim for as much as horizontal real estate because i really like to put multiple files one by one you can do that by clicking and doing like that so this is just something i like to do for other settings go back to the video when i introduce the hall and this id so we're in main.c let's create the, our program so the first thing is we want to blink a led of course so if you watched our intro to the hull you know that you have to write between this user code begin and user code end lines uh, if you don't if you write outside of these boundaries the st uh, this st setup utility will write through it because it has to know what's your code and what's its code the initialization is only done by the software over here and that's why they put this kind of comments so it uh, distinguishes between your code and the auto generated code so let's create this little space over here for our code and let's just do a simple let blink for that we always do hull gpio and we can see all the gpio uh, if you didn't know control space does this and we need the toggle we also have a write pin which um, toggles the particular pin of the port either one or zero but we want to toggle led on its own we don't need to do that manually so let's toggle the led and the one thing that is very nice we don't have to find which pin and port the led is on we can go to the main.h file and look for the definitions whoa that's a lot of them so what i did as you can uh, you were able to see the led 4 for example was on gpio pin 12 of port d and what this after this it created a definition which quote renamed the gpio pin 12 to led 4 pin and LD4 GPIO port renamed as GPIO port D. And that's why uh, it's important to create a very readable code. If we did just GPIO, let's say, HAL GPIO toggle pin G, uh, port D GPIO pin 12, well, you will know that you will be toggling a pin 12 on port D. But what does that tell you? You have to put an extra comment to tell anyone else that's viewing the code that or to yourself later because believe me you will forget that you don't know what's going on in that piece of code but if we do this led4 port yeah we know that we're clocking something on the gpio port related to led4 and we can do the pin as well led4 the ld4 oh come on okay it doesn't want to oh let's call ld4 it doesn't want to propose now oh, that's weird come on so ld4 here we go ld4 pin here we go so when you see this line of code what does it tell you well it toggles pin on led4 so it toggles led4 that's great so let's create some kind of delay but no 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 this is not Arduino we have all delay and I can tell you that the info is in milliseconds and you will believe me. But how can you uh, make sure yourself? You can just hover over this function and it will open where the function is defined. You can also click and it will take you to the definition of this function. Here is a description as well. And you can see that this function provides minimum delay in milliseconds. So the parameter delay param delay is specified as time length in milliseconds great so we know that the input is milliseconds in this case our time period will be one second so half a second on half a second off so let's compile this Control b for compilation we can go to the project build all so as you can see it's compiling the project hmm. let's give more space not that i really need it but okay uh, so it took uh, a good amount of time because it had to compile all the libraries and now it's done so let's upload it how to do that well you can see this cockroach over here the debug roach let's go to debug configuration and the first thing you would want to do if you just got your board and you're just starting you do an stm32 mc debugging initialization here's the .elf file that has been compiled and this file is used instead of bin and hex files because it also includes the debug information so your id knows where the processor is right now so the processor is just running its default code and the idd had ide 
has to know where in the code the processor is right now. So this is the ELF file. If you go to debugger, we can see that the ST-Link is enabled. And so this is all that you're going to use. So this is all standard uh, configuration. You can do the shared file. So it will save a separate configuration file of everything over here in the local folder. So it travels with you as you move the project. I, on the other hand, have JLink. Uh, I haven't been able to enable this, uh, some parts of functionality of JLink when including like that. But if you do have JLink and you know why you should use it, and I will link a video, well, actually it's this one, I'll link it in the videos, where it shows you how you can convert the ST link, so this part over here, so you can reflash it to JLink software. So it uh, introduces you to all the pros and cons of JLink software and why would you want to do that. And uh, I did that because in company uh, where I work, we also use that, so that's why I'm gonna start a jlink debugging session over here which is roughly similar i just have to manually point it to the jlink software suite you can download and i'll leave another link in the description down below where you can download the jlink software it's for mac pc and linux and all these settings are default and so in your equivalent you will be here and you will have stlink enabled and you will click now debug but i'm gonna do this one but let's pretend it's the same so you're gonna click debug and it's gonna basically automatically uh, compile your code once again upload it to your processor so if you go to the console over here it was uh, uploading it to the processor and we can see that the processor is halted right now because pause is the only one that has been uh, grayed out and uh, resume is light so we know the processor is now here and it's waiting. The clock is zero and it's kind of shut down, you could say. So we can con uh, continue to walk through our code with F6. For all the uh, little uh, shortcuts, I will talk to you in between. And let's crawl our way to our function. And if we do F6, I see that my green LED has just lit up. So the LED4 is apparently green LED. And if you just click F8 or resume, the LED will continue to blink on my board. If you want to stop a program when it reaches a certain line, you can double click on the particular line over here. And it will create a breakpoint. And as you can see, the program just halted on this breakpoint. And I can click F8 again, it will run the program and just come back here. You can see it has been halted over here. So this is another great way. If you want to go into the function to see what it does, click F5. So this is jump into, and we have jumped into this function. This is the toggle pin function. We just walk through it and we return down here. Again, we go here, F8, and we run to here. So great, we now can toggle LED. Now let's uh, add a little more functionality. So you will set for future, so I don't make multiple videos uh, explaining the same stuff. In one of the previous videos, I told you how to use the built-in trace peripheral. So this is the peripheral that can send data through a special line of the processor to the debugger, and it will be displayed in the console. So I created a few functions on my second monitor, and I will be copying them in our project, and I will also be including them in the video description. So let's go to uh, somewhere above our code before the main, and let's go to private function prototypes over here. Make sure to write between the code begin and let's write this function and I'll explain what they do. The first one will print a character into the stimulus port of the trace peripheral. So these functions are all from this website that I mentioned in the previous video as well. So they talk about how this trace works and why are the functions declared as the way they are. So all you need to do is that this function is the main one that's going to print a character. It's always printing character. And then by using this function, we can create multiple functions like printing a string. So we call this print character functions to print a whole string. Well, I have another one over here. What if you want to print a number? You have to firstly convert a number to a character or a character array because it's multiple numbers if you think it like that. So there's this function, the print number function. This one firstly convert a number to a character array 
and then it just inverts it because to flip order because we're sending the first bit first not the last and then it just calls again the print character function and it prints the whole number so you can create this kind of variation on the original print character function so let's test it for for enabling the this SWO peripheral in your configuration if you have ST link we go down here and enable serial wire viewer enable it and then click and insert the correct frequency of your processor you can go back to the clock tree and see what it's configured this is the main processor clock in my case no in my case i will go to jlink debugger and it's to startup and it's here already enabled it's 168 megahertz so now that i'm here let's send something so let's go SWO control space and let's print a string let's say hello and a new line oh. hello backslash new line like that so we will print hello one after the other so we can click this one which is a magic button it's terminate and launch if it's not uh, available to you go to perspective customize perspective and then go into the set visibility to debug i think it's the first one yeah and here it will be gray and you can click on it so it will become available so then you go to toolbar visibility debug and here will be so you can click it so it's available to you and this button will just close the session because you all has to close the session and then recompile our software and start the session again so let's click it and it stopped well sometimes it's buggy so let's just manually restart it yeah 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 multiple problems yeah yeah, yeah. no problem oh there's actually a problem in our code great yes so there are going to be errors when you're working so this is one of them i forgot to copy additional settings and let's copy some definitions on here this is also going to be included these are definitions of destinations of certain registers for the trace cell so this is the peripheral that's going to send data to our computer so these are some definitions of where they're uh, in the memory address so this is the control register enable and the actual port when you uh, where this peripheral will read the data from and send it to our computer so this is also from this website you can find it in the link over here somewhere let's go down yes here's the github link you can find it there but i'm also going to include it in a separate file and i'll show you how to include that later so now if you compile control b again no warnings great let's manually start it again for you it will be the st link version so oh it's jumping around no problem let's close that like that as well and let's go down to the line and this is a quick way to get us somewhere without breakpoints you control r and it will run to the line that you have selected f6 my led just turned on and let's f6 print hello you can see that it printed hello and if i f8 it will run to this breakpoint but if you don't want to remove the breakpoint but run the program freely you can click this button the skip all breakpoints and just click run so it's running and it's just printing hello you can see that it's printing uh, but the refresh rate is a little slower so it looks like it's printing two hellos one after the other but it's actually printing hello and waiting hello and waiting but the refresh window here seems to be bugged a little bit and you can anytime you want just unclick this button and we'll stop at this breakpoint and this debug perspective will come on no problem so we just introduced printing string let's just read something useful from a sensor so we can call this video uh, starting a demo project not just a little led toggle so in our case i created another two functions that you can use and we're gonna go through them while they're written as the way they are i just copied it let's go to the beginning somewhere after the last one and this we're using spi so spi is not just enough to use the spi transmit and spi receive commands that are 
packed along with the library. You have to do a little bit else. You also have to, let's just stop here. You also have to write down the chip select pin and do a little bit of handling as well. So the first thing that you need to do with this IC, and you can again see it in the video that I made before, you have to send address where you want to transmit to, and then the data that you want to write it to that address. So this function accept the corresponding chip select port. So it pulls it low, so it starts, then it transmits the address that we want to write to, and then the data that we want to write into that address of the register. If we want to read it from the sensor, we can see that to enable reading, the first bit of the address has to be one, so the IC, the accelerometer, knows that we are trying now to read data from registers. So we just modified with a pointer, so the uh, value at the address of the pointer address is now ORing 80, or this can be interpreted as 1 and 7 zeros. So this is going to be added or written as a plus to the whatever the resulting is. So again, we pull it low, transmit the address we want to read from, and then receive the data that is coming from that address. It is a certain size, and that size we want to input because we, each time we can call this function, maybe we will we'll read one byte, two bytes, three bytes, however. So let's save it. Hang over here, and let's create a few variables. Let's be an original and create data variable and an address variable. An address will be, in our case, 0f or just f. This is the address of the who am I register. This register is very useful if you want to check if your peripheral is connected and if your connections are working. This value should be 11111 and the, the most significant bit and the second most significant bit should be zero. This is a value 63 in decimal as well. So we have to request, so we're gonna do SPI receive Yes, this function is going to be a address of HPI control space. So it's, this is this peripheral, and it's going to be a pointer of the address, pointer of the data, and the data size is will know it's one byte. So you're expecting one byte because it's also a one byte variable. But if you were expecting two bytes, you can do that. Two bytes in data and declare data as a array of two bytes. So one byte, two byte. And that way the array, the name of the array is also the point to the start of the array. But if you don't have array and just a variable, then you just, you have to include this symbol as well to indicate that this is a pointer to the data. So once we receive it, let's send it with print number function. And in this case, it will be data. Let's also print a new line so that way uh, it's not gonna just write data and then hello it's gonna be written to next to the data so it's gonna create a new line for us let's compile control b no warnings great let's debug it so again if you have turned it on stop it and again restart let's go down 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 this is where we want to see it. Control R, we came to this. Let's put a breakpoint over here. We can see that we read the data 255. This indicates an error, but before we do anything, let's see if we can read it. Okay, so we did. It print hello and 255. So this print number function is working. New line, we, you will not be able to see that, but let's go back and see what the data will be written. So yes, it did correctly. So I guess it was just an error of reading it for the first time. As we can see, the value is six, three. So one, two, three, four, five, six ones. And here's the six one. So it's correct. So the sensor is responding correctly. Let's go back. And the number, if we print it, it has been printed correctly. So that's it. That's something a little bit uh, more 
substantial than just doing an LED blink. But if you want to know more why uh, the SPI is behaving the way it is, go back to a video where I talked about the SPI peripheral and there will, you will be able to learn everything you need to. So thank you for watching and I'll see you later. Just before you go, there is one thing I need you to know. Uh, to make the main function as vague as possible so you can just transfer this project to any other processor. In that case you need to create another project folder again. So filling out the main again and all those functions filling them again. As you can see this is empty and only includes one thing. Your user, user begin include. I include my function dot h. I've created a pair of dot c and dot h files and all that I've done is that I created a dot c file called my functions where I included all those functions that we wrote before up here in the over here yes all these functions are over here make sure the print character is before the other two character because they rely on the definition of this one and it's also including the dot h where those definitions of the register addresses are as well the prototypes for these functions are which get included in the main so the main file will go to the dot h and see that these functions are defined and they're defined over here. So also include the main.h so the definitions for some variable types and stuff like that won't be missing. So for your download you'll be having .c and .h my functions and all you need to add is actually the definition of your uh, variables and this part of the main code which is the main code. So this is all I wanted you to know so have fun.